Tonight's guest is Nate. Nate, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vic. Glad to be here. Well, it's great having you. Thank you for your time. Nate, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Yeah, so I'm an uh, environmental specialist with a company based out of the Chicagoland area. We um, own several pieces of property from the south side of Chicago all the way up into Wisconsin. And um, I just do a lot of traveling, a lot of monitoring, and uh, work with my hands a lot. And I'm usually out and about in places that aren't too populated with people. Doing the kind of work you do, I could understand why you would be out in remote areas. I can only imagine the areas that you go to. And speaking of that, your encounter that we're going to talk about tonight happened near a place that's very well known in the dogman community. Please expand on that for us. Yeah, no problem. So the interesting thing about this piece of property is it's outside of Elkhorn, Wisconsin. When I started in this current position I'm at back in 2019, I had no idea what Elkhorn was to the dogman community or the Beast of Bray Road. I had heard of it, of the Beast of Bray Road, but I didn't associate it with the area. The property we have is actually an inactive quarry now. It's been inactive since my research, roughly 2008. However, due to state regulations and EPA regulations, we are required as the owners to still maintain um, records on the water quality that's coming out of the site. So once a quarter or every three months, myself or a coworker is to drive up to Elkhorn, which is about an hour and a half from where we're at, to get samples. So the property itself, I'm going to kind of describe this for the viewers, just for the sake of uh, trying to paint a picture here. I also um, will be providing pictures too, just to help describe it better because it is quite complicated. It's a private piece of property. So there's no one allowed on outside of my company. And then another parcel of the land is divided up with uh, another landowner. I'm not sure who that is, unfortunately. It's about, I'd say, a quarter of a mile to a, a half mile back from the main road that it's off of, and it's gated. There is an old paved service road that runs east to west from the main road all the way to the back end of the property on the east side. The north side of this property contains the quarry, and I'm going to call it a ridge, but in reality, what it is is a old large pile of recycled asphalt that's been stockpiled there over the years. The south side of the property is the part that we don't own. That is owned by another entity, but that is mostly old farm fields or it's been mined out. It's a uh, about 12 to 15 feet lower than the actual service road, but it kind of dips out that way. Um, and then towards the east side, there's going to be a tree line with, um, I don't want to call them rolling hills because I mean, Wisconsin and Illinois, they're not, nothing too serious in that, in that area is considered rolling, but they're decent sized hills for the area. So maybe about 50 feet to 25 feet tall, but they are heavily vegetated. And right before that tree line, there's then some equipment storage of just various farm equipment, stockpiles of mulch and all that stuff. But again, we don't tend to drive over that way because that's not our property. The reason I'm describing the tree line so much is that's where the our property ends with that service road. It ends at the tree line and then there is the um, drainage pond inside that tree line that our property drains into. That is the area I have to sample to actually um, uh, to get a sample. So it's about 100 feet back in the trees. And... The service road, it stops paving right there. So once you hit those trees, the road ends. It just turns into gra uh, grass clearing with brush on either side. And then you walk 100 feet in, and on the north side is the pond. So in order to sample this pond, what we have to do is we have to go to the far north side, which is basically even farther into the woods, to grab a sample. And I'll provide a, a picture kind of diagramming everything out so you can see just the layout of it. It's, it's pretty insane. So there's two ways to go about this. You could just walk the perimeter of the pond and get to these outfall pipes that we sample from. 
But doing so, you go through tall brush that's roughly peak of summertime. You're talking maybe five to six feet tall. And then the wintertime, it's just, you know, heavily laden. One of the caveats of this type of sampling that we do, it has to be during a rain event. So we don't tend to go through the brush due to the fact that everything's usually sopping wet and we'd rather not get wet. So the other way to get to this, it's a little longer. You backtrack on the service road, I'd say maybe 20 feet. You just take off to the north. It looks like someone at one point or another made a an old four-wheeler or off-road trail for their truck um, or some sort of vehicle that goes deeper into the woods. So you can follow that about 200 feet a little ways off the beaten path, and then you can come to these drainage pipes. Now, these pipes themselves are interesting, as in, I'd say, from where we have to sample, they're about 10 feet off the ground, and they drain into a gully that is not consistently flowing, but it leads to a marshland further back in the property. So what makes these pipes so dangerous, and there's going to be a picture showing this, you're going to see a bunch of old concrete's been stacked underneath it. I'm not sure if it was broken at one point or they just dumped some stuff there before the quarry shut down, but we use that to actually get up to the water level to sample. And it's quite actually dangerous because most of these concrete things are very loose and it can cause a safety hazard to to someone. I've almost actually fallen on them, and uh, there's a story to that later. So getting into the history of kind of how I came to where I'm at now. I've been sampling the site since 2019. And for the first year, I had no idea that this was a uh, possible hotspot for the Beast of Bray Road or, or Dogman. And it wasn't until I'd say middle of 2020, uh, the summertime when we were doing our summer sampling, that I had to uh, detour due to road construction. And lo and behold, I had to turn onto Bray Road. And it was roughly three to five miles away from the property. And as a fan of watching shows like uh, Monster Quest or listening to just, you know, Dogman Encounters or other shows on YouTube, I, you know, I, I am familiar with the Bray Road Encounters and stuff. So it kind of clicked in my head of, huh, that's interesting. And that also explains why prior to that realization, why I was always so apprehensive being in those woods, even though nothing ever happened it was just the woods themselves were just extremely quiet and it just seemed like there was a predator around. I don't want to say it was every time, but I could tell you three out of the four times I had gone up previously, it was always just eerily quiet and not the quiet of solitude or, or, or lack of humans. It was just quiet. Like you couldn't hear anything. Once you hit that tree line, all sound just cut off. Back in the quarry the, and the surrounding fields, there was animals all around. Like you, you had deer, geese, cranes, hawks, coyotes, all sorts of animals and critters were all, all, all over there. You think, I'm not saying they're always out, but I can usually guarantee I'd see one or the other whenever I drive up. So that's the history of just kind of the, the way the layout is and just how the property looks. So now we get to the uh, first part of the, the eeriness is, you know, middle of 2020, I realized this was the real deal here. And I got to the property and I uh, just went about trying to sample. And I, I walked into those woods and mind you, you have to leave your work truck a good, you know, 300 to 400 feet away from where you're going. So it's not like you can just jump back in your car if you get scared. You know, you're 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 out there uh, with your uh, backside exposed. So I started walking towards those woods. As soon as I hit that tree line on that old four wheeler path, it just went dead quiet. And there were birds in the air, and there was you know all sorts of things in the fields. I felt fine. The woods, huh. that was um, that was just. Too much for me at that point. And again, this could have just been me psyching myself out. There might have not been anything around. But I was so put off by that. I actually went back into my work truck and um, I grabbed a pickaxe to bring with me along with my sampling equipment, which 
we carried and it, it basically equivalents to a rifle case. There's a uh, measuring tool that it's, it's pretty awkward to carry around, but we have to carry it along with uh, bottles and stuff that add in the backpack. So all that attached to me along with a pickaxe. And this goes back to that whole sampling area. I uh, climbed up on this concrete to try to sample with a sharpened pickaxe on my side and um, almost impaled myself. So I almost uh, bit the bullet just due to my paranoia. So that's the kind of the first realization encounter. Obviously, nothing happened. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. Just the lack of sound and just the eeriness of the woods just put me into such a state that I just kind of, I don't want to say it was a freak out, but it was definitely me not thinking straight. So fast forward a couple months into the fall, I went back in September, roughly a 2020. It was just right before COVID and all that fun stuff. I had to go up there. It wasn't for water sampling. It was just to help out a coworker. He had to grab samples from one of our stockpiles up there that we were um, we were producing some uh, material up there that we had to sample. I agreed to go sample it for him, and I knew the area well enough so I could do it for him. So I drove in. So instead of going to the tree line at that point, I went down to the quarry instead. So the, the service road kind of forks off then into a separate road that leads into the quarry. And this quarry is roughly it's probably about a 50 foot decline from the service road to the quarry. So it's a little ways down there. And I drove my truck down halfway down and then I parked it and I, uh, uh, I had to walk the rest of the way to the actual pile I needed to sample. There were a bunch of nails on the site, so I couldn't go any further with the truck or else I'd pop a tire. So sampling the site, I had to have my back to the North, which is that asphalt Ridge. But it's so old, it's overgrown at this point with young saplings that I'd say can go 10 to 15 feet tall and brush and all sorts of stuff. Not to mention the pile itself isn't exactly even. So there's like an almost an artificial rock outcrops along the way that are, you know, five to six feet high that just kind of just disrupt your sight. So again, I had that eerie feeling. It was quiet again. and again i was just nervous the truck was far away from me and i'm sampling the stockpile the problem is to do that i had actually turned my back to the ridge so i spent 30 minutes doing that and for those 30 minutes of my life every time i'd sample i'd turn around and look at this ridge i didn't see anything didn't hear anything didn't smell anything nothing seemed off outside of just how quiet it was so this ridge stands roughly 20 feet above the quarry and leads directly back into those woods where the service ponds at, uh, where the runoff ponds at. So it is all connected and it's all interesting, to say the least. So now I'm going to get on to the actual sighting I had. We're in late May of 2021. I had gone up there with a coworker this time to sample since we all agreed that sampling the um, pond was too dangerous just for one person, just due to the safety hazard of the concrete, the goalie itself with the mud and the equipment you have to bring over there. So he had come with me to assist. And uh, as we're driving up the service road, I had told him a couple of times he's been passing about, you know, the beast of Bray road and he's a non-believer. He did not believe me whatsoever. And I don't blame him. I was skeptical myself. But we pulled up to the pond at the edge of the service road, and he got out of the truck first. I was putting on my safety equipment at the time, and you know I hadn't gotten out with him. But as he opened the door, we heard just kind of a sound in passing. It sounded like someone like a growling slap or, or, or yelling, a combo of the two. Mind you, I heard that for a brief second before he closed the door, and I saw him walk out in front of me. And he kind of was pausing and looking at me as I'm putting on my hard hat safety vest. I hadn't realized really what had happened. You know, I'd heard it, but it hadn't registered. Then I get out of the truck and close the door and the sound is still going. Mind you, this is 10 to 15 seconds later. And he's about 10 feet in front of the truck. And he looks at me while this sounds going. And he's like, do you hear that? 
And I said, no, man, you are you messing with me? And, and not exactly the same terms, a little more colorful. And, you know, at that point, we had both kind of realized how stupid we were as scientists and investigators. We, you know, we should have shut up and actually just listened and not been bickering amongst ourselves. But by the time I got out and shut the door, another probably five seconds go by and the sound had died off. So the truck at this point, just to paint the picture so everyone can clearly understand it, is at the edge of the service road before it turns into this little grass path that leads to the drainage pond. What we're looking at to our due east is basically the road and then nothing but that tall brush I was talking about that's five to six feet tall. And then further back is another line of trees. And then off to our left is the pond, uh, a small lip that was the artificial bank created to house the pond. And then a large hill that leads into that asphalt ridge I was talking about. So we're looking off at those trees. And again, we're both in disbelief of what the heck we heard. He's absolutely besides himself. He's all gung-ho wanting to find out what it is. My brain had finally kind of kicked in and it's like, no, you didn't really hear that. And, you know, I'm trying to go through my head and I'm not a professional scientist, but I study the sciences. I've done my time at university, graduated, all that stuff. And I've made a profession out of being accurate data where I'm not just going to jump to conclusions before I have all the answers. And obviously I knew the legends and the lore, and I did not want to believe it because it doesn't make sense. There's no evolutionary prerogative for there to be an upright walking canine in Wisconsin or anywhere in the world. I had always looked at it as entertainment. And, uh, you know, I'm going through my mind trying to rule out my knowledge of the woodland critters. What the heck could have made that sound? It wasn't a fox. It wasn't a dog. It wasn't a bear. So we're kind of running out of thoughts here. It wasn't a deer. I've heard deer before. Sure as heck was not a deer. The closest thing I could pitch it to was a person. But here's the problem with that. We had a good view of the area. I'd say, you know, you know, we, we could see roughly, because the weeds weren't as tall as they could be, we could still see 50 to 100 feet in any direction before the real thick woods took over. And there was nothing there. There was no one there. And I can replicate the pitch almost and the velocity to a certain extent, but I cannot do that sound for 15 or to 20 seconds that it's, it's impossible. You have to have a huge lung capacity to do that. And again, it's just so deep that you have to put so much effort into it. it, it you can maybe last a five seconds at max. So that was the first thought in my mind of, Oh, this could be what I've been paranoid about this entire time. It wasn't an aggressive sound. It was just monotone and consistent. And it just, it just kept going. And I just laugh now because we did not sit and just listen. And we could have got maybe more details out of it had we not been shouting back and forth at each other trying to figure out who was pranking who. And I know it wasn't an actual person because the gate was closed. The property itself is miles from people. And then on top of that, absolutely no one would want to be in there. There's, just, there's no reason for it. There's no traffic. There's no reason that they would know we're coming. We randomly choose it on the day we go up. We don't tell anyone outside of our boss. That's it. There, there should be no one there. The quarry itself is only active as we're preparing to sell it, maybe five to 10 times out of the year. And it wasn't active. So there was no one there that day. So that was the sound. We didn't see anything else outside of that. I didn't smell anything. But again, the woods were quiet. There really wasn't anything. Thankfully, it hadn't rained enough, and we were still in the drought from this summer, or we were just starting the drought. The drainage pond was actually low enough where we didn't have to worry about sampling water. So we, uh, well, after some minor convincing, 
my uh, coworker, who's all of you know five seven and maybe 140 pounds, sopping wet, wanted to go further in down the path to see if he could see anything. And uh, I told him he was uh, that was probably the stupidest idea you could possibly do. And let's not do that. And let's get back in the truck and uh, go to the uh, quarry because we had to sample more product that day as we were um, we had restarted production a couple of weeks prior. So at that point, we get back in the truck, back on out of there and uh, make our way back down to the quarry, which is probably a quarter mile back on the surface, maybe an eighth of a mile back down the, uh, the service road. We get down there and this is the exact same stockpile I was sampling about a year prior. So we split up the work and we start sampling. And uh, I start getting that feeling again, like I'm being watched. And again, it's just quiet. I don't know why it was quiet, but it, it just was. So we're sampling and I kept looking back over into that ridge. Didn't see anything. So I get bent back to work. A couple minutes later, I start hearing this. I think they're called, it's, it's, a, it's called a murder of crows. It's a flock of crows, basically, that had perched up in some of these trees. Started just going absolutely ballistic. And I'm, I'm not talking just the casual communication. I'm talking it was like they were alarmed at something. It, it, it sounded like maybe there was, it could have been a predator going through there, a person. I mean, but I don't think, I know crows are smart. They have their own language to a certain extent. So it's, they saw something that freaked them out and actually spooked several of them out of the trees. And I looked into the sky to see if it was a hawk. There was no hawk. So I started scanning that ridgeline. And as I'm scanning that ridgeline, that's when I uh, saw the figure. And again, this was not my brightest day, and I, I, uh, I really did fail. And this is one of those things where you uh, are kind of embarrassed talking about it. But I glanced over it at first. I kind of did a glance, and then my brain kicked in, and it, just, it, it was like, "What the heck is that?" And that's when I was able to, you know, come back and at least see it partially before I continued, you know, my scan. I, I didn't believe what I saw. Um. So I saw this thing for maybe about five seconds at most. And like I said, I was so taken aback by it. I, I kind of started, looked away for a second and then looked back and it was gone. That's how fast this thing moved. Now, again, I go through my, my thought process of what the heck is that? And I start going through the list of what it could be. Well, judging by the size of it, it could be two things, or three things, a person in a brown trench coat with a furry hat on that gives him ears, a dog man or a Sasquatch. Well, I still wasn't convinced it was that. So I even went as far as to say, maybe it was, maybe I just caught a hawk charging out of the sky and grabbing something in the grass. Maybe I saw it, maybe I just saw the silhouette of it doing that so fast. But it, again, I saw it for too long. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll explain later why it wasn't that as well. So I looked over at my coworker who had his back to the ridge. And I asked, do you see that? He's like, no, what? And, you know, by that time it was gone. And the... Crows were still going nuts, but outside of them, there was no sound. Um, and at that point, thankfully, he had finished his his half of the sampling. I had finished mine. We tucked tail and ran back to the truck. And then we spent the next three hours of our day just discussing between ourselves what the heck we heard. Like I said, we went through the fox. We went through wolves. We went through lions, tigers, all sorts of things. And there was nothing. That matched the sound. So at that point, about a, a day or two later, I did reach out and make a Reddit post and shared the story as well. I was able to confirm with other people that it was probably not something natural that we at least accept in science. So 
I'm going to kind of double back here and try to describe this thing. It was almost like a timber wolf color. Like I said, it was mostly darker brown, but it had some other variations to it. But like, like I said, I saw it for such a short time, I couldn't tell you. But from what I can remember, it looked like it had some variations to it, but it was mostly dark. I did see the shape of ears on top of its head. And mind you, I was looking back on it all and doing some my own investigating. We were between 750 to 1,000 feet away from this thing. So the details are not pristine. You're not going to. I'm not going to be able to tell you there was drool dripping down its face or if it had what sort of color its nose or tongue was. I don't, I don't know that or its eyes. I just saw the outline and I saw what looked to be, like I said, um, looked almost like a point. I don't want to say it was a point and snout because I, I didn't get that good of a look, but it, it could definitely go that way. And the neck was just thick like really thick. So it looked almost like maybe it could have had a mane at some point or another. And then the rest of it was just, like I said, that this is a different coloration and most, but mostly dark. But again, at this point of the encounter, I'm still trying to tell myself it was something else. So my coworker and I go out and we kind of decide that end of that day, we have to go back anyway. We're just going to, do an investigation and we're going to do this proper this time and not be, not be idiots. So about a week later, it had rained between then and the, uh, you know, the time we saw this creature. And then when we went back in early June, the, uh, the plant was running. Unfortunately, the quarry was actually active that day. So all the heavy equipment was running. So we went back, did our job. And then I had him stand where I saw this creature. And I pointed him and I explained to him how I wanted to take the pictures. And I walked up to this ridge myself and um, went and posed and stood in place for this creature. So for the audience, I stand a little over 6'4", and I weigh in roughly 230, 235 on a good day. With my work boots on, I stand roughly 6'6". So I'm by no means a small person. And... The reason I went back into this investigation was to kind of prove myself wrong, to, to, to prove myself that it wasn't this thing. It was something else because it's going to be smaller than me. It's going to be, you know, comparable to maybe a dog on four legs. Well, I went up to that to top of that uh, ridge and stood exactly where I saw this thing. And my coworker took the pictures. When I went back down, I was careful on the way up and down to look for any signs of tracks or a kill of some sort to, you know, cause like I said, if maybe if it was a hawk, maybe it had caught something. There, there were no feathers. There were no, no remains of anything. It was just grass up there and a little bit of uh, the asphalt covering. And I walked back down and my coworker shows me the pictures. And, uh, this thing dwarfs me. And I'm not saying this is like, it's slightly tall. I mean, no, 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 no. This thing is me. Add on another two feet and then widen me out by another half a person. This thing was big. So at this point, I'm kind of relieved that I'm not great. I'm, I'm not seeing things. I, I for sure saw something that big. So what could it be? Oh, I don't hear of any black bears that get eight and a half eight to eight and a half feet tall and can be that big. I, they, they just don't get that big. You might have the rare freak of nature, but they're not going to be in the Southern Wisconsin. That's for sure. They'd be newsworthy. People would have seen it. Brown bear. They're not around here. Uh, mountain lion. Didn't look like a mountain lion. I've, you know, I've seen those, not a mountain lion. And we don't have them. They're not that uh, around here either. So at this point, I have to at least accept the fact that as much as I don't want to believe. And again, to this day, if someone is going to tell me or, and show me pictures that, Hey, there's a, a bear up there in that, in, in that quarry or those woods, I, I will be thankful. But as of right now, there, there's nothing there outside of the beast of Bray road, the dog man. It's the only thing that could have been that big. It just, it just fits the lore, the location, 
the encounters I've had, the feelings I've had. There's nothing else. And that's the encounter. And like I said, we've gone up a couple more times for more sampling and just to, and just to kind of check out the area. And the, the place just seems perfect for a predator. It's secluded. There's no one around. There's plenty of food, water, and game. The property is ripe with deer tracks and other animals. It, it makes scientific sense for a large predator to be okay and hide there. And there's no one around. I'm just going to keep restating that there is no one around. We, there's maybe someone there once or twice a week, and it's only at certain spots. So that's my encounter so far. I have to go back up in a couple of weeks and resample. And uh, I am afraid. I'm not going alone anymore. My coworker has agreed to come with me. And he uh, he is like me. He's open to it. He won't say it outright, but he he knows he heard something and he can't explain it. And he knows whatever it was scared me to the point where I, I, I was just terrified and wanted to just get out of there. You're right. Listening to you describe that area sure does sound like it's a great place for a large predator to make its living. Okay, I've got to ask you, Nate, when things go south, as it sometimes do, is your coworker lucky to have you around or are you lucky to have him around? We always joke because we, like I said, we have a lot of properties and some of our properties are in the city of Chicago and not the best neighborhoods. So I am, he jokes and calls me the enforcer because I usually can intimidate people with my size and just kind of, you know, keep them away from us and let us do our thing. You know, I can talk them out of doing something stupid that they don't want to do. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but as you know, you're not going to intimidate a dog, man. That's not going to happen. Yeah, the thought crossed my mind, like, you know, what would a pickaxe really have done besides piss this thing off? You know, or, you know, him wanting to go back there when we heard that sound, I, I just think to myself, you know, what would I have done? You know, at the end of the day, if that thing wanted us, it could have got us and he would have been puppy chow first and I would have been on my back and to get to that truck and, I don't know, might have figured out what I might have done at that point, but probably would have ran away. But we can all think of other scenarios. <laughs> Oh, sure. Yeah, if things did go south, all you could do is just watch what happened. That's about it. Like you said, you couldn't stop anything. When you heard that growling after getting out of the truck that day, how close did the source of the sound seem to be to you? That, that's the thing. Like, It didn't even sound like an angry. It sounded like a combo between a growl and like a, almost like a yell, but like it, it wasn't like vocally. Like Everyone talks about the intensity of it. It was intense, but it didn't seem like it had malice to it. It just seemed more like whatever this was, we caught off guard. And it just kind of had a, oh, I should probably sound the alarm. These idiots are here to sample the water. And again, I'm just playing devil's advocate now. I'm trying to, you know, if there is an intelligent creature in there. They probably have an idea of what, you know, just based off of how often I felt unnerved there. They probably recognize the work truck. They probably recognize us to a certain extent, and they understand what we do and where we go. So I, I do think they understand that, and they move out and let us do our thing, and then they know we're out of there within, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Oh, sure. Yeah, they definitely do study us. Who knows how many times it was watching you when you're in that area doing your thing? Oh, I certainly hope not. I don't want to think about that right now because that just unnerves me of how many times I've had my back to the woods and just oblivious and trying to macho man it off and not be nervous. Well, it should make you feel better. You had all those opportunities to attack you and you didn't. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine. Please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Also, you should know, I've got a new Bigfoot show I'm producing. It's called My Bigfoot Sighting, and I put a link for it in the description for tonight's show. You really should check it out. If you listen, you'll see that it's a different kind of Bigfoot show, and I think you'll like it. All right, now that I've shared that with you, let's get back to the show. I know you wanted to verify what you saw, but didn't you have misgivings about going back there to take those pictures the way you did? I was nervous at the start, but due to the fact that the equipment was on and the plant was operating nearby, most of the critters had been scared into the woods. And what we did when we actually got there, we actually rolled up with our windows down 
on the work truck and we had our cameras rolling on the phone for any sort of sound. And we went up to the actual pond first to make sure it was, there wasn't anything going on there. And like I said, I'm discounting this one right here, but we actually heard a rock clack when we were back there. But I can at least throw that off because that hill off to the um, north of that pond is old asphalt. When we were walking back further to the drainage pipes, we scared out a doe deer from the brush. So I'm thinking maybe she just hit like a, a, a patch of asphalt, which caused the rock clacking sound. But that's the only thing there. Um, and then uh, when we went back to take the picture. Like I said, that's right in the quarry. So we had all the equipment running around on us right there. So anything was in the area was driven off, thankfully. So um, I did go up there and I made sure I was alone. And uh, I did pose for that. And I got on, I was on two legs for one of them. And then another one I was on, uh, I was squatting down to simulate like a dog or a bear almost. And the reason I don't think I really saw any shapes of legs clearly not counting the duration of it because I wasn't really focusing there was due to the fact that there is a slight lip on this asphalt pile. So it has the grass growing out of it now. So that goes up like two feet and then you have that lip. So that's another foot added to it. So, you know, you got three feet of not seeing things clearly. And that kind of helped me figure out maybe how this thing disappeared so fast. And that's why I'm coming back to the whole, it had to be a dog man or almost uh, likely because there's nothing that, you know, it had to get on its belly to not be seen. There's no way a creature that big can move that fast in, in the brief time I took my eyes off it. So I'm thinking this thing probably dropped down onto its belly and just kind of slid back a little bit when I realized I saw it. And for a fact, I, I, I'm pretty sure it ran up through that dense brush on that, on that one hill where we caught that doe the uh, next time we were there. And that's probably how it got to us because on the top of that ridge it runs back into the woods so it had literally all these little nooks and crannies working kind of hide behind brush piles trees asphalt to hide to get to that spot and that spot itself is the perfect lookout point to overlook the entire quarry and the surrounding fields so it, it's a great vantage point for a hunter it's no wonder he was up there then you mentioned the rock clacking. Have you heard about any Sasquatch sightings being reported in that area? I haven't. And like I said, just the location itself and just the eerie feeling I got just kind of, I, I don't think it would be a Sasquatch. And, and the ears that I saw on the top of its head kind of steer me away from that. Oh, sure. Yeah, it definitely wasn't a Sasquatch. Have you ever considered quitting your job due to being required to go back there? If I, I think if I told my boss about it to a certain extent, I think they would uh, give me some sort of allocation about it and just tell me not to go up there and have someone else do it if I really wanted that. But with my coworker with me, I'm we're at least able to do that together so where I'm not as put off by it. And the nice thing about our position is we have a whole quarter to do it. So you got 90 days. So if one day is not good enough or it's eerie, we even try it again another day. It's all you have to do which is the nice thing about my job. That is a nice perk. And like we've talked about before, definitely listen to your instincts. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to start listening to that a little more and uh, stop trying to write stuff off and definitely be a little more careful when I'm in the woods and on different sites because there's a lot of stuff around Chicago can get pretty eerie. Yeah, that's a good move. When you saw it up there on the ridge, was it doing anything of note? It was just looking. Whatever it was, I don't want to say we made eye contact because I never saw eyes, but I, I, I certainly feel like we made eye contact because there is no way it would have disappeared like that if it thought I, I hadn't seen it. And whatever it was, it just, it, it just, I had the feeling of, I just need to, we just need to leave. Let's just leave. That sound we heard earlier was it's telling someone not to be around. We left at that point. If it's looking to, like, you know, like I almost await it to like, almost like a scowl of some sort. Like I said, like, you know, when someone scowls at you and you're just kind of like, ah, oh, maybe I should maybe not be here. That's kind of the, like the mannerism I got from it. And again, this is from a, a shape almost a thousand yards away, but it's body language was on point because I was intimidated. I didn't want nothing to do with it. And we left really fast. Well, as you found out when they want to get a point across, they're really good at doing that. Even if they are a thousand feet away. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, like I said, if it had gotten closer, that would have been too close for me. It can stay that far away and I'm just going to respect it. And I'm, I'm going to, tr- I told my coworker, we're going to treat these things like a bear. If we run across it, we're going to respect their space and we're going to back up together calmly. And we're just going to get in our truck and try to leave. We're not going to run, but we're, we're certainly not going to sit there and antagonize it or try to get pictures. If, you know, if it's, if it's, if we're out there in, in the open, it's, that's just, that's not the brightest idea. That's definitely the best way to handle it. Before we continue with tonight's show, I've got some important news for you. On August 20th, the premium membership program is ending. That means after August 20th, there's only going to be two ways to listen to the show. You can use your favorite podcast app to listen, or you can use the Dogman Encounters YouTube channel to listen. If you go to dogmanencounters.com and visit the podcast page, you'll find a list of podcast apps that you can use to listen to the show and You'll find a link to the Dogman Encounters YouTube channel. All right, let's get back to the show. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Nate. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Honestly, I would just say to people wanting to see these things, um, you don't want to see them. I, I saw one far away. And from the encounters I've listened to over the years, it just seems like this is something people aren't ready to see, nor can you logically explain it because there is nothing in the fossil record that we know of that can explain these things. There's nowhere. We have no idea where they came from. They're a mystery. I I, I know they exist to this day. I, I'm, I'm right there with it. Now they have to exist if I've seen this thing. And maybe there's stuff that's hiding that we just aren't being shown or told, but sometimes it's just best to leave things alone and just go on with your lives. And that's kind of what I plan to do. I'm, thankful my fiance was supportive of me this entire time and my mother they believe me and no one's ridiculed me and you know they understand that i i saw something and at this point it's a dog man it's all it is there's nothing else in the books that makes sense and it just makes you feel very small and very insignificant and it just makes you realize how mysterious the world is and how much we don't know and i'm humbled and grateful for that and I'm also a little bit terrified and scared about what the future holds and what these things might do if I'm there alone again. Well, that's all very well said. Nate, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing that experience with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Vic. I appreciate you taking the time to listen and helping me through all this. And it makes me feel better knowing I'm not crazy. There's other people out there who've, who've seen stuff like this. Well, you know, you're welcome. And yeah, you're far from being alone. Having said that, thanks again so much. Have a great night.